Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name's Toby, and today I'm joined by Dr. Leda Rincon Garcia. She recently completed a PhD in political science at the University of Barcelona and the Barcelona Institute for International Studies. Her doctoral research was on the policy of universal basic income, looking at public opinion on the issue, but also more broadly at how policymakers respond to evidence in this area, as well as how the evidence affects public opinion and broader social and political debates. She's also worked separately on interest groups and gender topics, including sexual violence, among other diverse research areas. So, Leda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Toby. Thank you for inviting me today. It's a pleasure. So, Let's start with the easy question. Tell me about universal basic income. Uh, What is it? So universal basic income is usually defined as a universal, unconditional and individual cash payment made to all of the population uh, with no strings attached. So that is regardless of your personal ability and your working status. And it's basically the idea of giving everyone a minimum uh, income to live with and be able to participate in this society in which, of course, you need um, material subsistence uh, to be able to live. So this is the idea. It has been gaining a lot of attention in in policy debates in recent decades. Yeah, it certainly seems to be an idea that's in vogue at the moment. Why is that? Yeah, so basically this it's a policy idea that has not been yet implemented anywhere, but there are different states which are kind of uh, enduring different pilot projects to test the potential effects of uh, this policy on individual well-being, but also on employment rates and so on. Basically, it's, it has been gaining recent attention with the fears of labor automation and digitalization of work. Yeah, and I guess it's something that's hard to run a really convincing experiment about because it operates at the level of a whole society. Yes, yeah, so it's it's a very complex policy to test, basically because if you think that it's an income that is given to everyone, it is very difficult to design an experiment in which you have a suitable control group, right? Because there's no, if it's an income that is going to be given to everyone, then you wouldn't have a control group uh, ever. So how can you measure this? And also there's the question that usually experiments at the end of the day, they have to be economically and politically feasible, which means uh, using all the resources, uh, not only to test the policy per se, but also kind of to give it to the population groups who need it the most. So at the end of the day, many experiments are, instead of giving it to randomly assigned units in the population, so random individuals, they end up giving it to individuals who may need it either because they are under a particular income threshold or they are unemployed um, or they kind of fulfill other types of need criteria, right? So at the end of the day, there's no experiment that really has giving it to everyone. Hmm. Okay. And out of all this very broad area, what's your specialization? So my PhD focuses on public opinion towards this idea. And I look at survey and experimental data in Finland and Spain. So I compare to very different welfare states. And the idea is to find out first how the different policy characteristics affect public opinion support towards this idea. So is it the universal character that's kind of hindering support or is it the unconditionality? Can we change support levels if we change legal requirements or the funding mechanisms? And also how the characteristics of individuals have an effect on support for this policy. So is your ideological stance makes you more or less supportive of this idea? Is it your economic status or your working status that makes you more or less likely of supporting this idea? Hmm. Wow. And then, of course, I look at the impact of uh, scientific evidence on support for the for this policy. Yeah, right. And that's the area we should absolutely drill down on in this conversation. But I have to ask first, and now that you've dangled all those questions in front of me, Um, What's the answer? Without walking us through your whole PhD, do you have an idea of how public opinion is affected by different ways of thinking about the policy? 
Okay, so first I do find that the policy characteristics matter, but they do so very differently. So for example, uh, my findings indicate that in Spain, the, the universal character of basic income is an, an obstacle to support because here in general, the population is much more favorable to giving income to those people who need it. Whilst in Finland, it's not the universality that really, that really matters, but it's the unconditionality. So uh, the population in Finland seems to prefer policies that attach recipients behaviorally in some way to the income support. I find some similarities, though, uh, across contexts. So, for example, in both contexts, uh, there is a high support to funding a UBI progressively. Um, so, for example, through taxing the rich. Even in Spain, um, having a universal benefit is as popular as giving an income support to those who need it the most if it's funded by the rich. So if it's a uh, progressive UBI, UBI receives as much support as uh, means-tested schemes, for example, in Spain. That's one of the findings. I also find that um, ideology really determines uh, support for UBI, especially if it's uh, supported or if it's introduced as a welfare-enhancing scheme, then it receives more support from the left, which is quite intuitive. But um, there is much, there is increased support from those on the right if it's um, introduced as a form to uh, retrench the existing uh, welfare services and, and schemes. Okay, interesting. So then as one small detail in all this, there's a research paper you wrote, which I find intriguing and which is the reason I asked you to appear on the podcast. And it's about evidence and policy. And the title is The Reverse Silver Bullet. So perhaps you could tell us a bit about that study, like for a start, what does the title mean? So the reverse silver bullet refers to the conventional, the, the expression that has been used in evidence-based policymaking, uh, which is the silver bullet. And it refers to the use of uh, kind of a killer piece of information by policymakers to back their policy proposals. So when they are looking to generate support and acceptance towards their policy solutions, so to speak, policymakers will sometimes use scientific evidence to back their proposals. And this is what's called the killer piece of information or scientific evidence. What I mean by the silver bullet reverse is, or what I try to allude to is whether this um, scientific evidence can be used even in the absence of demand by policymakers. So will it be as effective in attracting policymakers support and attention if they do not uh, request scientific information before? Okay, and, and will it? Well, what I find is that this is not the case. So policymakers will not pay more attention or support more policy proposals or be more responsive to public opinion or civil society or interest groups if they receive um, scientific evidence. Quite on the contrary, it's more kind of the announcement of ideas that really attracts their attention. Okay, which is, um, it's an interesting conclusion, but it's maybe also an unsettling one to be faced with for those of us... Uh who basically work on trying to help scientific evidence to influence policymaking. Um, if it turns out in this study, at least, that including evidence didn't help. So what's going on here? Can you tell us a bit more first about the study? What exactly did you do? Okay, I embedded a field experiment, uh, which refers to, to clarify the concept. A field experiment is simply an experimental design which is embedded in the real life context where the interventions will occur. So experiments typically uh, are random assignments of a given treatment, so a given condition, to certain units. And this randomness ensures that we can kind of identify a causal effect. That is, if we randomly assign a unit um, to one condition and the output changes, we can be confident that the output has changed only because of this condition. Right, that is kind of the value added of random assignment. Um, well, in field experiments, the treatment is assigned in the real, real life condition. So in this field experiment, I embedded an experiment where the treatment or the condition was the type of information. So either policymakers were given ideas-based information or scientific-based information. 
And kind of the initiative in which this was embedded is an advocacy initiative by uh, an organization that promoted uh, the idea of universal basic income. And that was trying to uh, raise awareness of this idea and also kind of launch a fundraising campaign. So all policymakers were were contacted by this organization, but they were randomly assigned to two different types of information. So one in which the the idea of universal basic income was presented uh, using different ideas. And and in the other treatment, the idea of basic income was presented with a series of scientific evidence. So um, here we presented data, we presented citations of different types of reports and so on, and the real effects of the different studies around basic income. Which policymakers were you targeting? Uh, members of the European Parliament. So we contacted all of the members of the European Parliament. Right. So you sent a bunch of emails to all MEPs and, and randomly half of them had information about the scientific evidence behind the argument you were presenting. And the other half were just, what, proposals? Like, it would be nice if... Yes. So the same, exactly the same information than with the scientific treatment. But all this information was it was not a campaign of references, was not a campaign of data. And it was discussed as an idea and as... Uh, so UBI could potentially uh, improve employment rates and so on. So all kind of in a... Uh, as a potential but not uh, an actual effect. Yeah, I see. So the evidence-free emails were all about potential, like arguing how things might be. And for the evidence-based emails, it was talking about actual studies where these effects have been demonstrated. I, yeah, I get it. And you recorded then the effectiveness of these two approaches. Uh, we recorded what I call the uh, attention rate. So first, uh, the email opening rate. So how likely uh, an MEP is of uh, opening their email. And then uh, the response rate. So whether the MEP responded to the email and also whether the MEP decided to either meet with the organization or participate in the fundraising campaign. Yeah, and it turned out that those who not had the scientific evidence were more likely to engage. Yes, so uh, those who received the ideas treatment, so to speak, uh, were much more likely of opening their email rates. So in essence, we can say that this is kind of an attention rate. So the ideas treatment gathered much a higher attention rate than the evidence-based treatment. And then after this kind of first threshold, the treatments did not make a difference. So one can say that actually it's the announcement of ideas which generated the higher attention, not ideas per se or the type of information per se, but the announcement. Right. So presumably when you say they opened the email, that implies you had something in the subject line of the email that they could see before they opened it, kind of like announcing what was in it. Yes. So there's two sets of treatments. One was in the subject line and the other one was within the whole email. And it was the subject line treatment that made the difference. Essentially, whether they thought they were going to read evidence or ideas made the difference as to whether they bothered reading it or not. Exactly. Hmm. So I, I, I really want to get your take on what you think is going on here. But I also want to make sure we've covered the methodological basis first. So one question is this. There are many different kinds of evidence you could have offered, which I suppose might influence policymakers in different ways and to different extents. What kind of evidence exactly were you presenting in the emails that were about the evidence? So the evidence was exclusively based on the different kind of pilot projects and experiments that have been going on around uh, with regards to UBI. So I think there were four different studies that I employed. One uh, was definitely on the experiment in Namibia, uh, another one on the MinCom experiment in Canada. And there were a couple of others that were included. And also there was data on public opinion support. So actually some survey data as well, uh, which was included in the email. So yes, so generally there were reports about the potential effects of UBI. I see. And did you send two identical messages to the different groups, like only one with footnotes pointing to evidence and the other just bare ideas? 
Or were they completely different messages, one entirely about the evidence and the other one entirely about the ideas? Yes, exactly. But the texts were very similar. The only difference was that references were excluded. There was no data included in the ideas-based uh, treatment. And then just uh, the, the verb tense used. So instead of saying yeah, UBI can or UBI has uh, changed uh, the employment rate, it was uh, spoken as ideas or concepts or, or the potential of UBI rather than the actual effects. All right, got it. So, so then let's speculate a bit, because as I said, this is um, a challenging result. I mean, granted, it's just one study, but if this is generalizable, it's not what one might like to hear working at the science policy interface. So do you have any theories or just any sense of why MEPs were receptive to one approach and not the other? So my first intuition would be that when policymakers are not actually working on a specific policy proposal or have a specific policy problem, they, of course, they look out for ideas rather than evidence, because why would you look out for evidence if you're not tackling uh, with a specific policy issue or problem? Uh, so you're on the lookout for ideas, and that is how different ideas may catch your attention. Of course, this is not fully pessimistic to the, to the use of scientific evidence. It just means that we need to learn how to communicate scientific evidence appropriately. It doesn't mean that policymakers or uh, political representatives completely ignore scientific evidence. It just means that the timing matters, that the topic matters, uh, the issue matters, and how you frame science greatly matters as well. Right. So according to that theory, then you ought to be able to rerun the experiment with an issue that MEPs are looking at right there and then, say something you had to vote on in the next few weeks, and then maybe they would have been more interested in the evidence. Yes, I mean, I wouldn't know. I would have to rerun it to, to understand. But of course, uh, that would be a key hypothesis. The other thought that I had that I want to run past you and see what you think is that maybe there's something about targeting MEPs, right? So parliamentarians. Um who are elected officials and their background is party politics. And so like their bread and butter is political values and ideas and debates, as opposed to, say, civil servants like policy officers in the European Commission who might be dealing with actually drafting the details of the legislation. So maybe the lesson to draw from this result is that this specific kind of policymaker, the parliamentarians, responds best to arguments about debates and ideas because that's what they care about. Yes, yeah, so this may be partly true. Hmm. But they're also agenda setters. I mean, they also kind of have an agenda setting potential and they have to make decisions about what policies they support or not, about how they tackle specific um, policies. So, so they're not kind of just responding to public opinion and short terms. I mean, they, they actually work once they're elected, right? Uh, on different policy proposals and so on. So one would expect that they would pay attention as well to, to scientific evidence. Yeah, absolutely. That would be good. The other question I had is, or the other thought I had is that maybe it's more about the messenger because this is an advocacy group writing. And I mean, so if I receive some campaign material from, uh, I don't know, an environmental charity, I kind of take it as read that they are going to present me with the evidence that aligns with their point of view. So in a way, hearing Greenpeace tell me that climate change is a threat doesn't really add anything. I mean, because of course they'll say that. Who knows? Maybe they're just presenting one side of the evidence and not telling me about all the hypothetical reasons to think climate change is no big deal, right? Whereas if a scientist or a group of scientists gives me exactly the same evidence, I might take that a lot more seriously because then I would expect that they're presenting me with the balanced scientific consensus. So I wonder whether in this case, the MEP might think it's of no additional value to me to hear what this group says the evidence is about UBI because of course they're going to present only the evidence supports their view. What do you think? So certainly, I mean, this, this seems very plausible. So there might be a source effect, of course. But then... Yeah, it's something that it's certainly worthwhile to explore, but it's also the case that certain advocacy organizations are also sometimes thought of as experts, right? So you would think that Greenpeace is a credible source and that it also dis would choose its scientific evidence well because it's an expert on, this, on these issues, 
yeah, it's something that might be worthwhile exploring. The issue which, when I was designing the experiment, I was thinking about how to include this is that if you already include uh, different types of organizations, this is also a treatment, right? So if you use the name of a scientific organization and then uh, different types of organization and so on, this may also bias the results because you don't know what policymakers are thinking about when they're thinking about these organizations. So do they know them? Is it their reputation? So there's a lot of different things that then chip in for a result. Mm -hmm. One other thing just came to my mind, but I don't really know where I'm going with this. Perhaps you can help out. Do you think there could be something, I don't know what, about the specific topic of UBI that means people are less in the market for evidence on that topic and more in the market for ideas and value arguments? Mm. I mean, feel free to... Tell me no, you're the expert on this. No, I would have to think about it a bit more. I mean, and this is something I argued in the paper, for example. I don't think this may be the case because UBI is discussed in both ways, in with regards to the values and ideas around, around this policy proposal, but also with regards to the evidence. Because, of course, it's a value-charged policy proposal, right? Ultimately, it's also about rights. It's also about um, making a change to the welfare structures and systems that we have now in place. It's about gender equality. It's about ecological sustainability. It's about transforming the way of operating in a society and so on. So it's discussed with regards to many ideas that don't need evidence, but also cannot have evidence, right? Because you cannot test the potential of UBI to attain human rights, for example. This is a question of values. So this is on this is on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's also discussed very much with regards to the evidence. So can a UBI increase um, employment rates, for example? Can a UBI increase the take up of welfare benefits? Can a UBI increase the equality, for example? So it's also discussed with regards to to the potential effects. So I think that necessarily UBI is not an idea that is more prone to be discussed. Uh, with regards to evidence or with regards to values? I think it's both. Yeah, I was wondering, because listening to you talk just then, I'm wondering whether the main argument that opponents of universal basic income are likely to use is that it won't work. So then that would be a question of the evidence, of not being convinced by the evidence rather than any like deep principled opposition to giving people free money. Is that the case? Well, I'm not sure. I think there's two types of opponents, right? I just think there's people that think that this is really a, a bad idea. I mean, why would you give people money when people can make their own money? So in principle, it would be a bad idea. And there's also people who think that it would be costly, unfeasible or inefficient. <laughs> okay, I'm going to change tack a bit here. Um, and I want to set a kind of as it were, a friendly trap for you by asking a question that I hope will allow us to talk about a different issue in science for policy, because I'd really like to hear your views on it. So so here's the trap. (laughs) Um, I'm going to guess that it's not coincidence and also not pure scientific curiosity that prompted you to make a study of universal basic income and indeed make this topic of your PhD. I think maybe you find it also politically attractive as well as scientifically interesting. Am I reading this right? Well, I think it has some interesting properties as a policy idea, in, especially in face of uh, the current welfare benefit systems that we have now in place, but also with regards to some of the key challenges that we are facing today. So if we only think about the COVID-19 crisis, um, well, especially the socioeconomic effects, the, the need for a buffer and a safety net and, and a really robust safety net for the population is really evident, right, with this type of crisis. We also have a very uncertain future labor market demand and structure um, that is really threatening the income security of our population and it's exacerbating inequality. So th- we have a series of challenges that are current understanding of welfare is insufficient to tackle. So I think that a UBI in this context has uh, some interesting properties. So by giving everyone an individual cash payment, you have a series of advantages that you cannot have with the current welfare schemes. So for example, uh, by transforming income from a benefit to a right, 
uh, you stop uh, stigmatizing the population, which could potentially have a series of positive effects. You also improve the take-up rates because currently we have an issue of, of non-take-up. So all of the many recipients who are, would be in principle eligible to receive different sorts of benefits are actually not receiving these benefits. So a UBI could improve this. Um, it could also improve the unemployment and poverty traps. Uh, so actually trapping recipients into um, into the dependence of the benefits that they are kind of eligible to. So, all right, you didn't you didn't bite quite as falsely as they hoped you might, but never mind. I'll I'll plow on anyway. So let's generalize a bit then. What do you think about what's sometimes called the activist scientist? So the scientist who takes a public position on a political issue linked to their research, whether that's like campaigning or lobbying or, or whatever. Do you think that's something scientists legitimately can or even should do? Hmm. So it's a tricky question. I would say it's important to distinguish on what grounds you're advocating for a policy as a scientist or as an advocate. But it's important to distinguish when you're advocating for a course without any sort of scientific backing. Um, I mean, you don't need scientific backing, right, to be in favor of, of particular ideas or or particular um, outcomes, so to speak. So you do not need this evidence. But you may use this evidence, right? So I think the key is really to make it really clear when there's evidence backing your your ideas and when there is no evidence. All right. So it's something about wearing different hats, to use the usual metaphor. So just as you can say, as a professional, I'm speaking from my own perspective rather than my employer's perspective, for instance, you can also say as a scientist, these are my personal views and not my views as a scientist. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's very rational. It does make sense. But I, I do have a couple of worries about it, nonetheless. The first one is whether those two things can really be separated in practice. So, I mean, one question is whether your audience will notice the difference when you're speaking as scientist versus individual. But then even more fundamentally, can the line be drawn so simply on the scientist side? I mean, UBI is a good example, perhaps. Suppose you're a researcher employed to work on UBI. And you also have a personal political conviction that UBI is a good thing, is the way forward. Would it not be quite hard to distinguish when you hold that conviction for personal reasons to do with your values or whatever, and when you hold it because of the evidence that you deal in as a scientist? And I might even go a bit further and say, I'm not sure the distinction makes any sense even in principle, because think about me as a non-scientist with no academic expertise in UBI or any other relevant topic. I'd still hope that my own personal views are dependent at least partly on the way the world is as I see it, which is like an empirical question, right? And not just based on my own personal preferences or upbringing or whatever. I just kind of feel instinctively chimes with me. Do you know what I mean? Uh, kind of. Uh, but of course, but as a scientist, so uh, with with scientific background, as a scientist, you know very clearly uh, what you know from science, what the scientific evidence is saying, but also the limits to this evidence and to this information. So you're very, very aware of what you can and cannot defend on the basis of science. And then the rest of it is your opinion, your views or your values. And you can make that distinction. Well, I think I think you could. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't be able to make this distinction. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that in the way you've presented it there, if you're self-aware enough to be able to separate your political views from your scientific understanding, then okay. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. But, but of course, there's then this whole other evidence about motivated reasoning and how and confirmation bias and disconfirmation bias and all of these things, which, of course you know, points uh, to the fact that humans, we're constantly kind of looking for the information that will confirm our views, of course. So while I already said my point of view that we can clearly distinguish this, I also acknowledge, you know, that there's a whole lot of other evidence which says, okay, we should be cautious about this because as human beings, we use cognitive heuristics and we use shortcuts to process the information and we tend to confirm our beliefs and so on. So... We have to be wary of this as well. Mm -hmm. Fair point. And then maybe, although 
we know all humans are susceptible to that kind of bias. You might become a bit more able to spot it in yourself or others, I suppose, if you have some scientific training. Yes. Yeah. And then the other thing I, I wonder about is whether we have a problem with interest bias. So imagine a young scientist choosing their research area. They, they're likely to be drawn towards a topic that they're interested in, of course. I mean, that's only human, right? So if that's something like, oh, I don't know, cell cytosis or dental health or whatever, then that's all well and good. But if it's a controversial topic politically, then there's a possible risk. What if all the academics working on UBI are doing that because they think it's a cool idea politically? Isn't that a worry for the quality of the evidence they produce? Hmm. Well, I would say it depends. So if we're speaking about scientific evidence, and I say this because I've been to conferences, especially about UBI, and there is a, or what I have been able to observe is two very different stances between individuals who do qualitative research, where you um, rely a lot on your perceptions and your interpretation of qualitative data and so on. And they cannot, I mean, they, they do have to make this big effort to try to not be biased. And then the, the quantitative research, which has a clear method, you know, very clear rules as to what counts as evidence, what does not count as convincing evidence, what is the limitation of the findings, how would the findings apply in other contexts and so on, where I think this research does not have the same, um, it's not as sensitive to personal opinions and, and interest and, and so on. But yeah, I think that interest is definitely an issue uh, in, in the topics that are studied and so on, uh, but it has always been the case. So, for example, and, and there's there's a lot of papers in, in my field, which is political science, for example, there's a lot of papers which, which point to this. Uh, right to the the kind of the topics that are being researched is always because um, not only because of the personal interest of, of the researcher, but also where the funding is going. This is beyond the individual level effect of interest, right? But governments, agencies, universities, by deciding what sort of research is going to be funded and is going to be um, valued is going to determine what we have evidence on, uh, what sort of topics are being researched, and also the outcomes that we're going to reach. So I think, of course, interest is an influential variable, um, but it has always been the case. Mm -hmm. But I think this would have a, an important effect, especially on the on the volume of the research outputs that are being generated, but not to what extent this research output may be more or less biased. Okay, very good. And one more question on this as a kind of follow-up. We've been talking generally about advocating in public for a political position, but what about science advisors? If you're a scientist and you're asked to go into a room with policymakers and provide evidence to help shape their decisions. Do you think you're then under any different obligation to present things in a way that you might not do when you're speaking on TV to the public, for instance, or attending a campaign rally or writing for a newspaper or whatever? Well, probably, right? But it depends as well on the objectives. And if the objective is to inform about the scientific evidence, then it's clear that what can be said is, is quite limited. Yeah, sure. But okay, so suppose then the objective is indeed to inform about the scientific evidence. But then that's my question. So if a scientist has a particular set of beliefs about the policies that are appropriate based on their scientific knowledge, should we expect them to present those beliefs differently in a policy advice forum from elsewhere? Well, I'm not sure because I think... Uh, so, of course, yes, the responsibility is different, but it should be the same, right? Because if you're going to be informing about science, you need to be accurate about it and, and as reliable behind closed doors than to the wider public. So I would say it, it should be the same responsibility, right? Hmm. Fair enough. I wonder if maybe it depends a bit on the kind of controversy too. So, for instance, if you're advising on a topic where the science is clear, but there's uncertainty or controversy among the public... Um, like uh, vaccine safety, maybe, or climate change. Maybe it's justified for you to, to go in banging the drum for a particular perspective compared to an issue where there's also controversy in scientific circles, maybe like UBI. Because um, in that case, we might hope the advisor might be a bit more reticent and not just go in with their own agenda. 
Uh, more or less, I just I, I was caught up thinking on what you said about UBI and the fact that it, it's also debated. So it's controversial both in scientific circles as well as the broader society. So so when it comes to the evidence, I mean, the evidence is not open to debate, right? The evidence is there. The other thing is whether we want to act on the basis of, of that evidence or whether this clashes with, I don't know, other ideals and uh, other objectives and uh, our current economic systems and so on. So I think the evidence is there that wealth is increasing, that inequality is also exacerbating. But the question is, do we want to do something about it? I mean, the evidence is there. This is not debated. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know if... Okay, well, I hear what you're saying. I mean, you have the facts on the one hand, and then you have the question about what you want to do with those facts, which is a different thing, right? And not something science can be determinative about. But I'm not sure it's always as black and white as that. I, I think it's reasonably common to have a situation where you have two different people who accept the same objective, but they have different political views, exactly because they have different views on the evidence. So, So... Using UBI as an example, again, you can imagine one person who says, I don't know, I support a universal basic income because the evidence shows it will reduce inequality and I want to reduce inequality. And another person who says, OK, sure, we all want to reduce inequality and I would support UBI if I thought that would really be the effect. But in fact, I think it'll have these different, less good effects instead or as well. So those people share the same objective. And in fact, they share the same evidence, but they disagree on what the evidence means, whether it's clear or unclear. Just like you can have um, oil companies pointing to scientific evidence and saying, look, it shows that we're not a major contributor to climate change, or at least it doesn't yet show we are. Yeah. No, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, that's true. Uh, also, there's broader effects always, right? So we can have we can be really clear about the specific effects because we're testing at the micro level, for example, even with vaccines, right? But then there's kind of the broader um, long term and widespread effects that we are really uncertain about. So yeah, right. And then that opens up questions of each person's tolerance of uncertainty and perception of risk and so on, which is a fascinating topic in itself. But I have to say, one for another time. So before we go, I want to say thank you, Dr. Leda Rincon, for walking us through this particularly interesting area of science advice and providing some real food for thought. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, Toby, for inviting me. Um, I really enjoyed it. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learning societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko. So I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.